can go in and then on top of that, help our partners work on uh, the best way to capture the right users. So we have a case study that's on our website right now. We worked with Lee Enterprises, so that's a conglomerate of local news in the Midwest. Um, is anyone here from Lee? Oh, hey, um, so good job. Uh, so we, uh, we worked with you last year and found that literally looking through the data, finding users who are visiting your subscription site and backing away, visitors who came to your site a certain number of times in a certain number of days, targeting those users with the right subscription offer, within six weeks we tripled digital subscriptions. That's really amazing. And by the way, that's not machine learning, that's human learning. There was no ML, it was all HL. <laughs> so, so my team, I mean, honestly, it was like, let's just think about this for a minute and see what makes sense. And so if you'd like to read the case study, it's on our Google News Initiative site, um, along with others. So that's, that's where we take the, the products, but then we also apply this approach of, okay, well, how, how can we do this better if we just think about it for a moment? And another product that I don't think gets enough airtime, so I'm just going to mention it right now, is our Perspectives API. So that is... Um, a, product that enables uh, content, it, it takes a look at your comments and reduces toxi to toxicity within your comments. And one thing that we know um, really leads to user engagement, and user engagement then leads towards propensity to subscribe, um, are the comment sections. So if once again we can take the heavy lifting off of not having to moderate those comments constantly, <coughs> Um, that's something that we could do. So I just wanted to mention that tool, even though it doesn't directly say subscriptions anywhere in the title, these are the types of products that we're trying to bring forth to the news community um, to create increased engagement and thus um, higher propensity to subscribe. So Microsoft News, we're trying to integrate calls to action for subscription and, and uh, newsletters in a number of different ways. So in, on our article pages, for example, uh, for our partners. In line in the, in the articles, there, in addition to the related links that we have uh, in the body of the text and a separate module that link back directly to your content, uh, we have calls to action in line uh, to sign up for uh, newsletter subscriptions so you can market directly to your users. Uh, Adam Rosenberg is here, he's working very hard on different subscription models as well. We're doing in line calls to action for subscriptions as well in the body of articles. Um, so that's on all the on all of the um, actual article pages. On the Edge browser, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the start page for the Edge browser, but um, we're working on a, on a feature where in addition, to be able to, uh, in, in addition to being able to like or dislike a piece of content, there will be a drop down that says subscribe, so you can sub subscribe directly from the front page there. So, so a number of different things that we're working on uh, to both directly uh, uh, promote subscriptions and also allow you through newsletters and, and different links like that to reach users to, to encourage that as well. Great. Let's shift gears a little bit. So we talk a lot about our search and social strategies and we talk a lot about algorithms and Amy uh, alluded to a change that Google is making. We were talking uh, late last week in preparation of this panel about sort of Google's algorithm and how you figure out what trusted news is and specifically the difference between national and local news and working in the local news environment. We have a lot of situations where something locally becomes national news. So we were talking specifically about the El Paso shooting and the fact that the El Paso Times, which is one of our organizations, was the premier news source for that, and how do you decide whether to surface that versus everything else that's out there. And then yesterday, you guys made an announcement related to that. So can you speak to that and the changes that are going to be made? Yeah, so, uh, so we, our, our search ranking takes in uh, many different um, characteristics, right? Um, first would be relevancy and authorita authoritativeness. So those are the two main axes that... Um, search is looking for. But yesterday we announced uh, our uh, inclusion of original reporting as one of the elements that we're looking at to address exactly what you're talking about. So we've heard from the news community over the years this exact problem. You work months, years to break a story, you break the story, and minutes later a news aggregator comes in and takes the traffic. Um, and that's not right, and it's not rewarding the right news organizations for their hard work. And once again, if you remember to what I was saying before, it's very important for us to have high quality 
journalism, high quality news in the news ecosystem. So we want, we want to be able to reward that. So uh, what was announced yesterday um, by Richard Jingris, our VP of news product, uh, is that we will be actually um, lifting up uh, original reporting and also allowing it to stay higher in the search rankings longer. So that's gonna um, combat, oh, thank <laughs> I had nothing to do with that, but I will take the credit. Thank you. Uh, no, it's, it's super important, and I do want to underscore that this is Google listening and, and believing that you're right and trying to solve this problem in a way that makes, that makes sense. So if you are interested, um, we have something called the Raider Guidelines. Not many people read, read through this, uh, but it actually you can find it online, and this is what our search raters um, evaluate when they're evaluating our search results. So we have humans look at how our search results did, and they don't create the search results, but they then inform the machines that do the ranking on how well they did. So this is actually going to be, original reporting will be added into the Raider guidelines. So very excited about it, glad to, I will send that feedback uh, back to the search. And when does that go into effect? I believe now. Yes, I'm getting heads waving, so I'm going to say now. <laughs> and recently, Facebook announced, I believe, a separate sort of news page or news feed feature that you guys are introducing. So can you talk a little bit about that and how it's going to work and how you're working with publishers on it? Yeah, so, and, and I think this is an interesting place where like, just the platforms work mm -hmm. differently, right? And when you go searching for, for news versus sort of social discovery, just, it, it's a different sort of thing that plays out, right? Um, and so, you know, when we look at, it, there's a couple of things going on when it just comes to news and news discovery on the platform. I was thinking about the other day, literally one of the first conversations I had with local publishers after coming from the publishing side uh, of things was like, what could we do? You know, what, what would be interesting on Facebook? Um, and like, I wanna say it was like the third thing that somebody said was like, well, what if there was a place on Facebook for news, right? Um, and here we are, not even three years later, uh, and, the, and these things are starting to play out. And you know, the first one, which, you know, I don't know if you followed the news yesterday, or Today In, um, space on Facebook, crowd participation, how many folks know what Today In is? It's okay if you don't, I can explain it. Um, now we, all the Facebook people know, that's good. Um, so Today In, is, in, uh, Today In is, is a space on Facebook that's really about local news and community information. So it's, you know, we've been testing this for you know, almost two years at this point. Um, it, it highlights stories from local publishers, uh, local groups that may be interesting, events, uh, these sorts of things that people really want in their community, which, you know, Facebook is about community. This is a really core part of it. And local news is at the heart of that. So it makes sense that, that local news is, is front and center in this today and experience. We've been testing this in about 400 communities in the US and, and yesterday announced that we have expanded it to more than 6,000 communities. Um, that's a really meaningful opportunity for local news to get in front of um, those local audiences that you're trying to serve. Um, unlike newsfeed, so in newsfeed, if you follow a page or if somebody that I'm friends with shares something, um, that's eligible to show up in my newsfeed. But my newsfeed's different than yours, and it depends on how often I'm, I'm interacting with the publisher. Uh, that drives, you know, to some degree, how much I'm seeing that publisher. Um, today is different. You don't have to be connected to a publisher for them to show up in, in the Today and surface and for you to find that story. So it's one uh, additional space where you can find local news and engage with it. And you know, our hope is keep following that publisher that you've discovered in that space. Um, you're going there intentionally, right? You want, you want to know what's going on in your community. Um, and so you see in that, because it's a more intentional experience than newsfeed, which is more serendipitous, Maybe I'm you know, walking somewhere and I'm looking at newsfeed. I may not have time to go as deep on a story. Today is different. I've gotten there because I do have time and I'm looking for that information. So we have that space. So now you've got newsfeed, today in, and, and now we are working on uh, a new space, uh, news tab, um, which I can't talk a lot about right now, but I can say that it is you know, a dedicated space that will be just news on Facebook. Um, and we, you know, we think this is important because one publisher say, hey, this could be really interesting and help us drive some additional um, audience and business for us. And we just know that there are people that are hungry for more news on the platform, and there's only so much that you can put in newsfeed without disrupting the friends and family core of what Facebook is really designed to be. 
So we think by having, you know, it's, it's additive to what you're, you're going to be seeing in, in newsfeed. So people will be able to find you in newsfeed. Uh, people will be able to s discover the stories that you're telling in, in the local community via Today In. And then those folks that really just want news and want to discover more news of the day can go to the news tab. Um, and it's all additive, right? And we think that could be really interesting. As with anything, it's a new space. We're excited about it. But um, we'll have to test and learn and see how it plays out. So to be clear, in news tab, you'll find news, but that doesn't mean the algorithm will change so that local publishers are pushed down or you're not seeing as much content in your regular news feed? That's right, yeah. And I think it's interesting to note that a lot of people actually don't follow news publishers, right? Like, I think coming from news, that was like the most shocking thing that I had ever heard, right? It's like, I follow every news page that exists, and it's like, that's what you see when I open up my individual news feed. Um, that's not the experience for a lot of people. Um, so I, I, it will be additive to that experience, and I think ultimately for those folks, you know, you'll still have those folks that maybe just want to see a story here and there that's the most relevant thing for them on a given day, but then you're going to have those folks that really want to go deeper. That's the opportunity here. That will all be additive. So let's switch gears again and talk about 2020 for a minute. Obviously, that's on a lot of people's minds. There's been a lot of discussion. We know what happened with Facebook last time. Google's been accused of suppressing uh, conservative news sites. So as this election cycle really heats up, what are your platforms doing to ensure that you know unbiased news is surfacing, that uh, you know, you're not being accused of anything, that you're keeping misinformation, disinformation off of your platforms? Yeah. You want to start, Gary? Yeah, I'll start. So, I mean, every partner that, that we work with, uh, we're vetting for quality. I mean, there's, there's no user-generated content. Um, it's all uh, pre-vetted uh, partners before we even sign a contract to, 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 uh, to share their, their info. So, so it's very well uh, managed and vetted. Uh, and the feeds that we get in, we're constantly uh, you know, the, the feeds are generally looking good from our partners when they come through. We're constantly trying to optimize those and make sure that the quality is, is high, which it, which it is by and large. And, um, and, and so that's kind of not, that's, uh, we, we all have such different models right here. Yeah. But I mean, as a, as a editorial first product, that's obviously the most important thing for us. You know, trustworthy, trustworthy news uh, from, from familiar brands is sort of our mantra, and and so that's you know we're we're invested in that deeply, and and we've had very good success with that so far. Yeah, I'd say you mentioned 2020, but Google is a global company, and we are literally working on elections every year. Right, elections don't just happen in the states, although when they do, it's big news. Um, so we have taken all of that experience that that we are undergoing constantly year after year. Um, and building upon the way that we uh, approach elections. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight would be uh, our work with fact-checking organizations. So this really spawned out of the French elections, which happened after Trump the Macron elections, uh, and uh, there were a group of news organizations that got together in France to create their own fact-checking, because they didn't want what happened uh, in, in 2016 to happen uh, in the Macron election. Um, so we learned from that, and we are building upon our relationships with third-party fact-checkers, not just here, like CrossCheck that we're working with, uh, but also down in um, Brazil and Argentina, we've been working with Comprovo. Um, so that would be one way that we're really addressing it. Um, the next would be um, Jigsaw. So we have an alphabet company uh, that has election protection tools. You can literally go to their site and it says, help me protect my election. Uh, and so there are a lot of tools that are being created. Um, uh, outside, that's outside the, the GNI, but Jigsaw is uh, dedicated to that purpose. Um, and then uh, in terms of bias, um, you know, we, it, it's not a signal that we look at. Um, we can't read context or sentiment. Uh, and third parties have independently verified that they haven't found bias. I think The Economist just released a year-long study of our search results, and they said that the search results were rewarded in-depth reporting, but it had nothing to do. It was either, either side of the aisle. So that's where we stand there. Yeah, we've learned you know, a lot since I think it, the point is worth emphasizing. We're also a global company, and so we're working on, on these things all the point. time. Yeah, well, I'm going to steal that one. <laughs> it's good that we both have that point, I think, right? But the, um, you know, we, we certainly learned a lot in, in the US from, from the last election. 
Um, and have been really, I think, transparent and open about this is something that we're working on uh, in a big way. We've hired more than 30,000 people around the globe to really focus on security and integrity of the platform. Um, and on our platform, it's, it's interesting because you know, we want to be an open platform where people can share their ideas and, and their views. We also want to make sure people have the right signals to know that what's, what's true and what is not. And we think of this through you know, uh, reduce, remove, and inform. So um, we work with third-party fact checkers that you know, independently uh, review articles that are flagged um, as possible you know, uh, fake news. Um, or false information. Uh, if they deem a story to be you know, untrue, we reduce the distribution on Facebook and we inform people that, hey, this you know, third party fact checkers have said this, this article is not true. Um, but we don't remove it entirely in that case, right? Because people should still be able to, to share, share their ideas on the platform. But we want that signal to be strong. And that reduction in distribution is pretty meaningful. Um, so it, it, it doesn't wind up taking off um, in the way that, that other articles might. Um, when we talk about removing, you know, we've done a lot of work to take down fake accounts and you know, that we'd often say the bad actors that are you know, just gaming the system, sometimes just for fi financial gain, sometimes to, to influence uh, opinions, that sort of thing. Um, and that work is, is really at the heart of, of some of our efforts in this space. Uh, and then when it comes to informing, we've done you know, a lot of work there as well. Um, a couple points I would highlight, you know, one is we, we've actually established a, a news page index, which allows us to know, like, this is a news page versus just kind of a, a page that's on Facebook um, in, in some other category. And with that, that allows us to, to say, all right, this is a news page, which features might um, this page need that are different from somebody else? Things like a breaking news indicator, uh, breaking news alert that we're testing, those sorts of things that are higher signal for people to say, a publisher is saying this, in, this information, that's a higher signal that they're uh, you know, a trusted source of information, high quality news. Um, we also took a, a pretty big step uh, in creating an ads archive uh, in the last about year and a half, I guess. And what, what this does, I, I think it's twofold. One, it, it brings transparency to the advertising process on the platform. Um, so you can go out into the ads archive and see anything that's related to politics and, and sort of issues uh, based advertising. You can go out there and see what people are, are, are advertising. Uh, that lives in that archive for years. So you can go out there and um, it provides a level of transparency that just didn't exist before. Um, so you can go and see, you know, are people trying to, you know, uh, shape my opinion on something kind of thing. The other thing that's just interesting about that and, and practically speaking as you gear up for 2020 is it's an interesting way to report, right? So you can go into that ads archive, see what candidates are spending on advertising on Facebook, and also see all the other things that are happening. Um, so it, that's kind of a, there's a lot going on. I think those, that, that reduce, remove, and inform is, is the, the framework though. Um, and I think what we would say, and this is a moving target, right? Like, you can solve some of these problems and, and the bad actors of the world will come in and try to game the system. So this will be something that's ongoing for a long time and one of the reasons we have so many people working on it. And is Facebook confident that these safeguards are gonna help protect the integrity of the platform as we go into 2020? Yeah, I, I can't remember the exact stats, but I, I think you know, independent reviews have shown that um, fake news and, and false information is down like more than 60% just in the last maybe year plus as a result of some of this, this work. And clearly there's more work to do there, but it means we're going in the right direction and these investments are, are going in the right direction. Great, well let's shift back to sort of the focus of this in terms of how local news organizations and news organizations in general work with your platforms. We've talked about a lot of different programs and ways you're doing that, but let's uh, give folks something that they might be able to sort of tap into. So do you have any specifically something coming up, funding that's coming up that anyone can get involved in, a program or that sort of thing to, to let folks know how we can better work together? Can I start? Because I have a list. <laughs> there were so many that I had to use my handy dandy, thank you, WordPress, for the, the notebook. Um, so yes, we, um, we, we do, um, and we do want to work um, with all of you, especially in local. Um, and once again, the idea behind all of these programs and initiatives that we've put together and funding the $300 million worth of funding from the Google News Initiative is to learn from all of our interactions and then bring to bear in our products and scale out our learning across the news ecosystem. So I just wanted to um, emphasize that. So far to date, we've worked with 
more than 350 publishers in 70 countries through the Google News Initiative. So it's been very exciting um, to have that kind of uh, global reach. And we're starting to get some of the learnings back in. So uh, YouTube, we haven't talked about YouTube yet. Uh, we announced $25 million in uh, YouTube News Innovation Funding, and we're already working with 80 publishers on that. Um, we've had an audio grant, $6 million, because that's the next frontier. And we really felt like we needed to put some money and some muscle behind innovating and, and partnering with organizations that can better innovate in that space. Um, the subscriptions lab that I mentioned um, that we're working on uh, both in the US and Latin America, we have a similar data lab that's happening. Um, we've funded innovation challenges around the world. We just closed our latest round in APAC. And that idea behind an innovation challenge is we actually have people apply for, a for part of the grant money to say, this is what I want to work on. And we fund them because their ideas um, could be something that either we could help them build later on or they can build themselves. So it's an incubator kind of startup idea there. Uh, we've trained 100,000 journalists in person via our news lab. So that's, that's amazing. And I would say in terms of what you can do right now, because I believe that was your question, so let me circle back. You can actually go onto our Google News Initiative training site and access, <clears throat> excuse me, hours and hours of training um, across Google's technology uh, and tools. And all of that's free. And I know a guy in the audience who's responsible for a lot of it, so uh, way to go, Nick. Um, but also, you can apply for in-person training as well. But I would say immediately, this is available to you at no cost right now. The other thing that's available, two things that are available, no cost right now, are our News Consumer Insights and Real-Time Consumer Insights tools. So we launched uh, News Consumer Insights about a year and a half ago, Real-Time Content Insights um, at just at, uh, in March at our one-year anniversary. And those are tools that help reimagine or revisualize your Google Analytics data. Um, you can be using free Google Analytics, by the way. This isn't for the fancy paid version. Um, and it helps you understand your user funnel in a way that uh, Google Analytics uh, at its core doesn't really do with news publishers in mind. So we've tried to strip it down to the metrics that matter to move your business, to drive your business forward, help you understand user engagement and loyalty based on the funnel. It's our premise that we're all in e-commerce here, whether you sell subscriptions or not, right? You're trying to make money with an online news site. So that's one area that um, something you can log on to right now, g.co slash News Consumer Insights. I promised the team I would tell you all about that. Um, there's another thing that you can apply for, which is uh, G Suite funding. So we've earmarked 100,000 seats for our G Suite tools uh, to uh, go free to news publications with fewer than 500 people working at them. Um, for slightly larger organizations, you can also apply for um, GCP, so Google Cloud Platform um, credits. So these are, these are resources that are available to you right now. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, what we're doing with the local news experiments. Uh, so that's a organization, or that's an effort to help us reimagine a local news site from the ground up. Um, it's overseen by Mandy Jenkins, who's uh, important here in the ONA world as well. Um, I think uh, that is once again trying to build on learning. So we're going to take all of our learnings from our other programs, pour them in um, to that initiative, and then share them out with, uh, with the rest of you. Um, only three more. Um, the first is Newspack. Well, you spoke for a long time. So no, no, I, this right. is great. I just so. I didn't bring my list. <laughs> Settle in, everybody. Uh, Newspack. So we're working we're working with uh, the WordPress folks um, to create a CMS and um, revenue solution in one. So we've provided some funding there. That should be something that when that releases, you can all take advantage of. Um, and. Um, player for publisher, I'll end with this. So this is a tool that we're working with 100 um, uh, news sites right now, and you can actually use this media player for free. And it's free, and all the advertising that you sell, all of the video advertising you sell that's <coughs> played through the player, you keep 100% of the revenue. So this is a great way to support um, videos and video ads on your business, and that's something you could take advantage of right now as well. OK, sorry. Thank you. Certainly. <laughs> So uh, for Microsoft News, what we want to do is partner with you, promote your content, and send you a check every month. 
basically, mm -hmm. right? We are partnering with 1,200 publishers right now globally. We have over 4,500 brands, uh, nearly 1,000 of which right now are local news. Uh, our local news initiatives are rolling out across the, across, uh, the US, of course, and, and around the world as well. And um, in addition to you know, our, our editorial work, uh, I'd encourage folks to go down to the fourth floor. We have a Microsoft uh, Innovation Lab down there where the Microsoft News Labs team have some really cool uh, tools that, uh, that they're developing for newsrooms to, to create efficiencies. Uh, video indexer so you can find, you know, using AI to recognize, they have a cool demo down there uh, for the State of the Union where they use AI to do facial recognition on individual people in the clip, so you don't have to watch. If you need a, a five second clip of Bernie Sanders looking grumpy at the State of the <laughs> Union, you don't have to scan three hours of it, you can just type in Bernie Sanders and then it'll, it'll tick all the marks in the, in the clip where it is so, so you can just go right to it and not have to scan. So they have Project Ida is another one where it's a similar thing with, uh, with documents that you can scan in just large amounts of unstructured data. So, so cool technical initiatives that we have going on, but overall, you know, we're a, we're a, we're a content uh, a platform and we're, we're surfacing uh, as much local news as we possibly can. Uh, if anybody, uh, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of our partners uh, here in the last couple of days, uh, a lot of folks that we hope to partner with still. Uh, if we haven't spoken to anybody yet uh, and you're interested, please feel free to talk to me after the panel. Um, but, uh, but it's making, you know, I mean, in terms of the impact on, on, on actual, uh, you know, on the bottom line, uh, we're getting, again, that sort of base level, local uh, 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 traffic, but then also these giant uh, spikes when breaking news occurs. I see uh, Tim Wolf in the, in the audience from Dayton. So we, we, we're, we're working really hard to make sure that we have the, the quality and the quantity of partners in a given market uh, before we roll, before we green light it and roll it out uh, to 100 percent of our users. Um, we were about three days away from rolling out Dayton uh, before, uh, you know, before, uh, yeah, we're rolling out on Wednesday. Of course, the shooting happened over, over the weekend. And um, so we didn't have the experience live, but we had the feeds in hand that we could surface to our national audience. And in that first 48 hours uh, after the shootings in, in Dayton and El Paso, I mean, the Daily News had, you know, seven-figure page views. WHIO in Dayton had seven-figure page views. El Paso Times, who we're also partnering with, also seven figures. So, I mean, it's, it's just a giant, giant audience. And, uh, and, and so that's what we're doing, and we hope to do more of it. Okay, great, and as Josh is talking, we wanna to get to some questions, so feel free to line up at the two mics, and then as soon as he's done talking, we'll take a few questions from folks. Um, I didn't bring my list, so that's on me. <laughs> um, no, but I, I'll do the shameless plug, the obligatory shameless plug for the Facebook Journalism Project website. So if you go to the facebookjournalismproject.com, this is really our central repository of, of things that, that journalists and publishers can take advantage of. Um, we have a lot of partnerships in motion, and you know, I think similarly to, to what's happening at Google, we don't want just the people and the publishers that are directly involved in those to be the ones learning. That's not the point of it. Um, so we've gone through, through great links to, to document what's happening and, and make those resources available uh, via the website. Um, we have trainings for journalists there. Uh, just a lot of things that I would encourage you to, to go and, and spend some time looking at the things that are available that could help you move uh, your shop forward and, and just some of it's more basic, some of it's more advanced, but I think you're going to find there's a little something there for everybody. Uh, some on the business side and some just on the day-to-day -day, like storytelling side of things. Um, I wanted to call out too, you know, as far as what you can do, everything that we're doing that, that, is, that is moving the needle and, and where we see the most exciting things happening is around where we're collaborating. And it's not just where Facebook is pushing that collaboration with publishers, it's where publishers are coming together to solve challenges. Um, you know, we're invested heavily in things like the Accelerator Program, which do this, um, but there are a lot of organizations of which I will not be able to mention them all, I will forget folks, but like Lion, INN, LMA, LMC, like 
these trade organizations that are out there working to solve problems with publishers at scale, um, that's really meaningful. We work really closely with those organizations, and those are just the ones in the US, um, because there's, we're not the experts. You're the experts, right? Um, these organizations are experts. Uh, and when we collaborate, and, and we just we do better work, and we, we know what we can do and, and where we won't be able to help. Um, as much, but we don't get there without that collaborative sort of spirit, which I can totally say might sound a little cheesy, but it's true. It's just at the heart of everything that we really see working um, from product development, where we work with publishers to build new things, uh, to again, programs where it's you know, maybe an accelerator program, or partnering with groups like you know, Report for America that is standing up uh, much different kinds of projects to support the local news ecosystem. Um, you know, what can you do? I would say get involved in those collaborations. We see it happening more and more like without us uh, needing to be sort of the mediator there. Um, I think there's just a sense of collaboration in the local news space that maybe didn't exist five years ago, 10 years ago. And that's really exciting and we want to be a part of that and we want you all to be a part of that. Um, so go to the website and see all the work we're doing there. All right, let's turn it over to the audience. We'll start with you if you can introduce yourself and then ask your question. Hey, uh, my name is JC Kanakosa. I'm a senior over at Loyola New Orleans. Um, right, yeah, right here locally. Um, so my question is, so basically this year, over $100 billion has been made in digital ad revenue, and Facebook and Google alone took over more than half of it. I was wondering if you guys think big tech companies should take less of a piece of that pie, newsrooms should get more? You want that one? I can, I can tell you this. I'll yeah. answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, for us, it's, it's hard. The, 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 we said this earlier, the internet, you know, 20 years ago, I mean, you put the number on it, but before, you know, Facebook even existed, started to disrupt the way people consume news and information. Um, and certainly, the, the tools that we've built uh, are, are really effective with, at helping people connect with people and helping advertisers connect with those people as well. You know, a lot of small businesses leverage um, advertising on Facebook to connect with the people that, that they're trying to reach. A lot of publishers utilize advertising to, you know, acquire subscribers and, and drive that, that sustainable business revenue through, you know, subscriptions. Um, for us, we're focused on building the tools that, that drive more sustainable value. So if you're a publisher and, and you're using Facebook, um, things like our subscription tool, we, we don't take any cut of the revenue. Things like, um, can't talk too much about like the news tab or today and like the revenue goes to the publisher, right? Like we're we're working to make it so that we get you and, and, and the stories that you're telling in front of more and more people so that you can capture that direct relationship and ultimately uh, drive that revenue that we know is is important to keep local news thriving into the future. Yeah, and I would I would say from our perspective, um, you know, Google shared $14 billion with publishers last year. That was up 12% from the year before, and it was up from $10 billion in 2015. So it's growing. So actually, the, the money we're putting back into the ecosystem is growing. But that's not the only place where we're supporting the ecosystem. So every month we send 24 billion clicks to publishers. Right? So that creates an opportunity for you as a, as a news publisher, wherever you may work after you graduate. Um, that gives you the opportunity to capture those users, show them your value, and monetize them, derive revenue from them in a whole host of ways. Some of that will be ad-supported, and some of that, importantly, critically, will need to be reader direct revenue. Right? And that's why we are trying to ensure this, this shift, try to be a leader in helping our partners, those that want to sort of cross that chasm over into a more diversified revenue portfolio outside of ads, um, we want to be there to support and help. Uh, so that would be our perspective on, on ads. You want to add to that? Well, I'll just, I'll just add that for Microsoft, every, all, all the ads that we have on our article page is all third-party monetization. Uh, is is revenue shared with our partners? We've we've paid out over 800 million dollars in the last four years uh, to our partners, and that's growing. We'll be over will be over a billion dollars soon. So that's that's uh, we're we're very proud of that. So you guys' answer is no, I guess. <laughs> so listen, the last eMarketer report I saw showed that the share, at least between these two companies, which by the way we get lumped together, but I think our business models are very different, yeah. um, is actually going down. So it's going in the direction you might want it to go. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. 
Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is John David Ow. I work at WBUR in Boston, which is a public radio station. Of course. And uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for recognizing that local is the new black <laughs> and that you're uh, appreciating the work that all of us are doing at the local level and how important it is to our democracy. Absolutely. So yes. very yes. important and very much appreciated. Um, as a nonprofit, donor-dependent, engagement-based uh, business that has the largest number of reporters on the ground in this country, aside maybe from the AP, I think we may even have more local reporters on the ground. What are you doing that is not a rev share, that is uh, enhancing the ability for people to denote, donate, to engage, to uh, build greater brand affinity to the news organizations that are providing you with content? Yeah, I would say um, just going back to one, trying to provide that technology layer to help you, um, you know, make sure that all of the work of your huge cadre of reporters is doing is, is, is seen and heard. Subscribe with Google is actually going to come out with a contribution uh, capability. Um, and some of the work that my um, News Consumer Insights team has done has been around trying to help partners launch a contribution model, right? Because you need to monetize in different ways. It's a completely different model. That's right. Yeah, it's a completely different model. It sounds a lot alike on paper to a lot of people, but you're living this every day. Um, so what we want to do is help give you that infrastructure um, and, and some consulting around it. Like, here are some ideas to try. We actually have a case study that I'd love for you to read on our site around um, BuzzFeed. We helped them launch. Now, I know, different national. No, I've seen it. It's, You've it's, seen it. It, it. it does apply. I've okay, yeah. great. So um, the, that's the, so just for everyone else, we, um, we worked with BuzzFeed. They were wondering what a contribution model looked like for them. Uh, so uh, our team went in, consulted with them, talked about what their goals were, what, what they thought they could ask their, um, ask their readers to donate. And importantly, we ran surveys on their site, and this is something I would encourage you to do, using the Google Surveys tool, which is free, by the way, um, and if you have any trouble with it, come to me, because I also oversee that product. Um, so they used surveys on their site to ask readers what they might, you know, why would they donate to BuzzFeed? What do they appreciate about this reporting? Uh, and they got really informative answers that then they turned around into their on-site marketing campaign. Um, and it's public knowledge, but their average donation was $20 right off the bat. That's cool. It was good, right? Very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were super psyched. So were we. Um, it was larger than we expected, but just doing that little bit of research about why people value what you're doing and then turning around and putting it in their words um, when you ask was, was something that really stood out from that case study to me. Is that, did that come through when you read it? It did. Um, I think that in terms of the shameless plug and looking at a BuzzFeed for-profit operation, getting contributions is a little different and the value <clears throat> proposition is different. And I think uh, the recognition of sort of the unbiased, you know, I'm doing the shameless plug thing as a public radio type. Yeah. So, you know, fair, you know, we, mm -hmm. we consider ourselves a, a real valued resource to the democracy mm -hmm. in this country and, and to uh, productive conversations beside, between all sides. And I think it's important to sort of hone in a little more on that part of the equation in terms of how we tell stories and the number of people who are listening to them. Yeah, I, I, I would call out, I think that's absolutely right. I think some of the work we're doing around subscriptions can start to apply and... and that's why I'll be haunting you. That's right, no, and as you should. I, I mean, it's, it's worth calling out. You know, we, we actually, over the last maybe six to eight months, have, have tested a news funding product at small scale. Um, you know, some of the challenges with it, I think, with any, I won't go, I could talk for a long time about it, but I won't, I won't spend too much time. Um, it's, you know, you could try to make it really, our, our subscription integration, you know, it takes some time, right? It takes some development resources. It's less kind of out of the box. Our news funding test is a little more turnkey, um, but that means you're driving news funding just on Facebook and you're also still doing all right. the other things that you're doing, right? So it's a starting point and I think, you know, at a high level, what, what we saw with the test uh, early on is one, we have a lot of room to improve it and so we would, greatly take your, your feedback. And, We're and super partners, you can ask um, the people at Google. <laughs> yeah, and, um, uh, but it, the more you engaged and like interacted with the audience and offered something more exclusive, it, it, it drove more right. um, 
you know, people were more willing to contribute, not, not surprisingly. So there's just that kind of product work that's going on. And there's a lot of room to engage on that. We actually have uh, Doreen Mendoza, who I'm going to call out as she's whispering to folks in the crowd. Uh, she actually on our team works specifically with nonprofits and, and I'd say digital startups um, in the local news space. Uh, I would bug her. She would love to talk to you. Um, but I would also call out some of the work of the Accelerator program, which we did a memberships accelerator, in fact, and had three NPR stations as part of that. Um, one thing we haven't done as good as taking the things that those three learned and getting that out in front of all of the, the, the NPR stations. But I think, you know, it, we have work to do there, but we fully see the opportunity and, and that this is a need. Um, and I would say Doreen and David Grant, who's also in the audience, you should bug them after. And if you okay. don't find them, let me know and I will make and sure you see them. One Raise more thing to add, you are in public radio. You have been asking people for money for a long time, yeah. right? You must know. Guilty I'll, as charged. Right, right? So <laughs> I got a tote bag for you later. But <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I love my tote bags from KQED, OK? Um, so because I'm a Bay Area resident. Um, so I would say, share that learning with us. What has worked for you? How yeah. can we then, 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 use, then use our technology brains to turn that into an online presence, Absolutely. right? So, yeah. so if you can help educate us on what's worked for you over the, the decades that you've been asking people for money, we will learn from that. And maybe we can work together, collaborate, as Josh was talking about. Gary, I know that's important to your business, too. Um, and, and together, we can try and work some magic. Yeah, I'd say um, I'd love to talk to you more about it, too, because we have, we have a fairly nascent uh, initiative on our side, MSN Causes. Mm. And um, so that is not necessarily for specifically for uh, nonprofit media, but it's it's general uh, NGO topic. It's we have a, di a monthly uh, a different uh, initiative every month, the, the homeless initiative, uh, environmental, uh, child welfare, a lot of different things where we are uh, having some original content, uh, a lot of partner content on these subjects. We're offering users uh, the ability to donate through a tool uh, to um, to. Uh, either on a national level, trying to make it a lot more hyper-local so you can really uh, donate to the causes that you're familiar with in your community. And, um, and I'd love to talk to you more because I think there's an opportunity there for our nonprofit media partners to perhaps donate directly, just like in our sort of like, dislike, subscribe. Maybe there's, some, maybe there's an opportunity there that we could, uh, that we could investigate as well. So, yeah. well thank you all. Yeah. It's great. It, it sounds thank like you. you have a lot of people to talk to. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <It'll be busy. laughs> so go drinking with all of them? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Just hit the return on investment for your trip to New Orleans right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are at time. I'm sure everyone has had a long day and is ready to hit the streets. So thanks for taking some time. And if we can thank our panelists thank for you. their time. Thank you.